Your attention, please. The Walt Disney World Railroad, now boarding for a scenic trip around the Magic Kingdom. Board. So, Brad, unfortunately, this week uh, we lost the voiceover guy from the great movie ride. You may also know him from Turner Classic Movies. Uh, Robert Osborne passed away. When they redid the great movie ride and TCM started to um, sponsor it, Robert Osborne is now a part of the show in the great movie ride. Through very well-timed acting from your driver, um, he interacts with the driver of the car. And uh, I think it's great. I think he, he's a very good addition to the great movie ride. Um, he, has some, he has some jokes in there and stuff, and, and it's pretty good. But uh, I thought that this week we could do a show kind of uh, as a tribute to Robert Osborne, but also as a tribute to the great movie ride, and just talk a little bit about uh, the great movie ride. I, I'm okay with that. I'm okay. So I'll be honest. I was not as big of a TCM watcher or anything. So I heard about Robert Osborne and I went, well, that sucks. You know, just because in general, people dying is not something I celebrate. Uh, I, I think people like that about me. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I, I definitely would say that the that the redo um, m- helped, I think. So, you know, the, the pre-show and post-show uh are definitely better now than than perhaps what they were in most definitely i don't know the pre-show i didn't have a problem with before but i feel like it is definitely more interesting uh and and with the post show but definitely the voiceover within the attraction itself i think that improved uh with you know the writing and, and he played that well so um i appreciate it uh but yeah so Anytime, anytime we get a chance to look at the great movie ride, I'm, I'm down. Anytime I get to look at any attraction more in depth, I'm down for yeah. it because inevitably I am so quickly reminded how little I actually know about anything. <laughs> and, you know, so when you go into research this stuff, it's just like, what? That's insane. Uh, you know, kind of like the whole, uh, what the, you remember when we did the fun fact on Splash Mountain yeah. and the Splash? Yeah. 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 Stuff like that. But, for me, the, the, the kicker, the biggest kicker in all of my research comes from the beginnings of the great movie ride because it's actually comes down to the beginnings of Disney's at the time, Disney MGM studios, which was initially great movie ride was going to be called uh, what great moments at the movies. I think mm-hmm. that's correct. And yep. was going to be in Epcot, <laughs> which I was like, what? what does anything that happens at Hollywood studios have to do with anything that goes in at Epcot? But actually Imagineering was looking at adding two new pavilions. So they had come up with this wonders of life pavilion that was going to cover, you know, the, the, the human body and biology and things like that. And then they had come up with this movie pavilion that was going to cover movies and stuff. And they were going to place it actually where Soren is now. Uh, so between Journey into Imagination and the Land, which yes, you do go through the land to get to Soren, but it's it's actually sitting over there between those two those two buildings, and you were going to have an entrance right from there. They were, you know, uh, what the the one art mock up that everybody seems to have of it is essentially like a like a really fake sound stage front with clouds drawn on it. But you were going to walk in and be able to learn about. How, how movies were made and things like that, a more educational perspective. And apparently Eisner saw this and said, well, instead of just making you know, this, this one spot in Epcot, making this one pavilion within Epcot, let's just go ahead and let's turn it into its, its own, uh, its entire own gate. And so Great Moments then becomes not just something, you know, probably the e-ticket, I would say, likely within the pavilion, but becomes a major attraction and, in fact, the, I would argue, premier attraction of Disney MGM Studios, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. I thought that was incredible because, again, like, I can't, I can't conceive of that existing within Epcot because it seems so uh, detached, but clearly Imagineering thought they could make it work. Yeah. 
So just some some very basic information, just in case you are not familiar with the Great Movie Ride. I I find it hard to believe that anybody who's listening to this would be, but just in case, um, Great Movie Ride is in Disney's Hollywood Studios, formerly Disney's MGM or Disney MGM Studios. Yeah. Yep. Um, it is about a twenty minute attraction, so it's a it's. Like Ellen's Energy Adventure, it's a nice way to get inside in some air conditioning during the summer and have a nice relaxing uh, car ride. It's a it is a dark ride, um, and basically you drive in this little car um, around different uh, movie sets and kind of movie experiences. And Robert Osborne and your driver tell you a little bit about movies. Uh, they do. At some parts, there's a little bit of interaction with some uh, some other actors that are blended in with the um, animatronics. But for the most part, you're just in your in your little car learning about movies. And it's really a, a great attraction. Claire and I usually ride it several times while we're at Disney's Hollywood Studios just because it's it's fun and uh, and we really like it. Um, there are two different uh, versions that you can get. Uh, one is called the what the gangster version and in that version um when you get to the gangster shootout scene an actual gangster guy comes out or girl hide or girl yeah an, an actual an actual gangster person we'll just say an actual gangster an actual gangster comes out and hijacks the car kicking your driver out and you go through the a, a portion of the ride with this gangster driving. Um, there's also the bandit version in which you pass through the gangster part into the old west part, and a bandit who is in a shootout with the sheriff uh, comes down and hijacks your car and drives through a portion of the attraction. So you do get a uh, a little bit of interactivity and a little bit of um, rewritability and. Not only in that you have a you know fifty percent chance whether or not you're going to get the gangster or the bandit, but also um, who is going to be the gangster or the bandit? Because much like Jungle Cruise, uh, who is who is your driver, and then who is either the gangster or the bandit is really going to affect your experience of this attraction. Because a good driver and a good you know gangster really make uh, makes this attraction really shine and i have had the good fortune to have both a really good driver and a really good gangster um on the same ride yeah and and it's interesting to to note that it's not random selection which one of those you're going to get if you want to ride one or the other uh assuming that assuming that it's running at full capacity in which case both shows are running if you get in either of the first two cars you're going to get the bandit version the second two cars are actually going to get the gangster version because the way that this attraction is set up, all four cars actually ride together uh, at the very beginning. Of, or all four cars, yeah, so two, two and two are, are connected together. And so they ride together through the first part, and then one car gets stopped in the gangster area uh, in the, you know, the Cagney, whatever you want to call that scene while the second car moves on into the Old West section, which is going to be where the bandit's going to enter the car. And then both cars are slightly separated because, uh, they, because they've done this, and they actually stay separated up until, I think, what, you go through Anubis, and you either come together at... Uh, I think you come together at, uh, at Wizard of Oz. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. That's what I was about to say. You either come together there or at Tarzan. But yeah, I think it's actually Wizard of Oz where everybody comes back together, and then you go through the the final scenes uh, going through this attraction. But yeah, so that's the reason... I've actually been delayed at Wizard of Oz and gone through that whole scene twice. Hmm. That's it was pretty fun. It was funny, something yeah. Was, something was broken somewhere then. Uh, yeah. I think there's only supposed to be the four cars active on the track at any given time, so it's not like you should be waiting for every for another set of cars to clear the load area or something. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I've I've seen the I've seen the end of that plenty of times because uh, I think we talked about this maybe on a previous episode. But a lot of times, uh, my mom or or Nancy will need a scooter, and so 
if you're in if you're doing that you you get stuck at the end so we get to watch the end of a lot of scenes not really <laughs> what's going on you know i would suggest if you can get at the front of a at the front of your vehicle or even the middle of the vehicle that's going to be a it's going to be a lot better for you but i bet you could yeah. even say hey you know what we did the gangster scene last time we want to do that or vice versa and probably ask the cast member and they would hook you up with you know at most you might have to wait for the next set of ride vehicles but yeah you can ride either one of those and what they're doing there is again trying to trying to run all the people through and if you're wondering what the ride vehicles look like again i don't know that a lot of people i i doubt many people listening haven't actually done this but uh and and even more so would have done ellen's energy adventure over at epcot but essentially the the energy adventure vehicles are these vehicles just much much smaller than those humongous gigantor uh, right. energy adventure vehicles, but they are the same basic vehicle, uh, just just you know set up differently. So it it's it's definitely a leisurely attraction. There is no there are no drops. I, I mean, other than other than the hijacking, there's really no thrills. Um, uh, I would say the I would say the the God of Anubis scene slightly. Yeah, yeah. After the after the hijacking, there is another scene where your driver uh, does rejoin you, and the hijacker is dispatched. Are you gonna put uh, spoiler alert on the beginning of this episode? Because you need to now, because you have spoiled everything about this attraction. Yes. Okay. I will put a spoiler alert at the beginning. But like we've said before, I doubt anyone listening to this has never been on Great Movie Ride before. But yes, we will. We will include a spoiler alert. So we've talked about the the multiple ride vehicles and that you go through the different scenes of a movie. It's also interesting to me that what you what you actually see, especially at the end of the attraction, wasn't even what was originally intended for the attraction. And in finding out what's originally intended, the last two scenes, to me anyway, make a lot more sense. So after the after the Wizard of Oz. Essentially, what the what the ride initially was going to do was you were going to go through the, you know, Wicked Witch scene and, you know, follow the yellow brick road. And then you hit that next scene, you know, the one that's Fantasia right now. Mm -hmm. And that was actually going to be the tornado scene from Wizard of Oz. So Hmm. you were going to get more Wizard of Oz. And then after you'd gone through the tornado scene, you would get to the final room where right now they have the they essentially have that little post show Here's a look at all the different movies thing. And they were going to split it down the middle. And I assume they were going to get rid of the Anubis. Uh, or no, I guess, I, I guess they could have kept the Anubis because they would just have your gangster or your bandit. But they were going to split the room down the middle so that you wouldn't see what the other car was seeing. And on the screen would actually be the, uh, would, would be the big fiery head from Wizard of Oz. And they would, you know, and essentially it would go through the and don't look behind the curtain and to the to your left or to your right, depending on which car you were in, whichever whichever way was to the sidewall instead of toward the middle, the curtain was going to reel back and would actually have your gangster or your bandit along with certain animatronics from the attraction all standing along the side. They would take a bow. There would be applause, of course, that was going to be piped in. And that was going to be the end to the attraction. So essentially, Wizard of Oz was supposed to extend throughout the rest of the attraction. But what happened was when Disney signed the contracts for the use of. So they had to, they contracted everything that you see in there. Uh, you know, they contracted the different movies. They contracted the sounds from the movies. They had to contract, you know, get get rights to have animatronics of people in there and, and their voices and their voices. And when they got the stuff for Wizard of Oz, they had the rights to do, you know, they had the rights for the, uh, the song that the munchkins sing. They had the, the rights to the, you know, to the little bit that the witch says and the little bit of Dorothy that you hear. And that was it. And essentially Imagineering just kept on building and just thought they were going to get everything to work. Well, they, when it came down back to licensing, uh, you know, MGM said, no, you can't have any more unless you're willing to pay more money and Disney wasn't willing to pay more money. And thus we have the last two scenes, which were essentially, you know, last minute, uh, revamps of, you know, what can we do? And last minute enough that the, that to either side, apparently the, the areas are built 
for the for that you know that for that final bow scene. And of course, huh. if you if you look at the Fantasia scene, that's actually a you know that is the tw- the twister is there. If you if you change the video out to go you know instead of having Mickey and the you know and and the water and all that stuff going on to the the house in uh, Wizard of Oz, boom, you've got your tornado scene because that was already built. And then they went, oh, we don't have the rights to that. So what are we going to come up with that we already own the rights to? And that's how you ended up what you ended with what you ended up with. Yeah, that's so <laughs> that's so funny that they they just assumed that everything was going to be okay and it turned out it wasn't but uh i think i think fantasia and what casablanca um i think those fit in okay you know th- it doesn't feel like there's a gap or or anything missing oh yeah yeah no i think i think it i think the whole thing was put together um very well but again it's just it's kind of interesting and then when the, when they say that because i mean i've never really thought about the fantasia scene and and the way that it's set up and again the the kinetic action that goes on there works for the works for the scene i think okay because I, I never looked at it and went that's really out of place but now when somebody tells me what was actually supposed to, i'm like oh so the reason that room was built that way that that totally makes sense because that's supposed to be a tornado um so yeah it's just it's interesting to to see that not everything always goes as planned James Cagney, who was a who was an actor in like the 30s, and he he features heavily in the uh, gangster scene. Um, apparently, his estate was not happy with the uh, the outfit that Imagineering had chosen for the uh, act the animatronic, and so his his family actually uh, gave Imagineers his real tuxedo uh, to kind of make it a little more classy and realistic. Apparently, e- Ingrid Bergman's family would not give the rights to her voice. Uh, so her her animatronic doesn't speak, which, you know, like, again, they b- made an Ingrid Bergman, or uh, I'm sure they made an Ingrid Bergman animatronic thinking they would get the rights to her voice. And I guess once you've made the the AA and you don't get the rights to her voice, she just becomes silent well and they um, didn't they don't have the rights to her voice but they had the rights to use her image right because otherwise they couldn't have you know they wouldn't have built the aa and then lee, lee marvin's character from uh the western movie cat by you was originally um going to be in the great movie ride but again his children refused to sign uh the waiver to put his likeness in and so clint eastwood was added which um, you know, I'm just a, a young person, but I would not even know who Lee Marvin was. Uh, so I think putting Clint Eastwood in there was a, a good call because, uh, yeah, I don't know who Lee, Lee Marvin is and I don't know what Cat you is. So whatever. <laughs> so so here's the thing. If Lee Marvin had actually made it into uh, the great movie, right? You might know who Lee Marvin was I would by know, now because yeah. you would have gone, oh, I should probably check out that movie. But yeah, so, um, and and check your show notes because I'm definitely putting a link to this in here. But uh, jimhillmedia.com uh, did an amazing uh, breakdown of the that whole story with the, with the you know, that, that essentially last minute AA. Basically, they thought we're going to have Lee Marvin so they had Lee Marvin ready to roll, and then they suddenly found out you don't have Lee Marvin. So what happens is Disney's president at the time, uh, Frank Wells, says, "Hey, I used to, you know, I used to work with Warner. I, you know, I did a lot of work with uh, Eastwood. I know that I can get him to sign off on it. So you guys go ahead and you get Eastwood, and we're going to get him in there, right?" So they, they build the, so they build a brand new AA get, you know, or at least a new face for who knows how much they actually had to do, but they get a new AA set up for this. And as they're running test, he's the one that they don't still have rights to. So they have the AA standing there, but they have a paper bag over its head. Okay. So, so the ride is, so they're doing testing with the ride, making changes to the ride with the, with one audio animatronic with a paper bag over its head because the lawyers are going to freak out if if you know this is seen as officially part of the great movie ride before we have a sign off on it and 
what is it, 10 days before the park opens, Frank Wells finally gets together with Clint Eastwood, convinces him to come down and convinces him to go and ride this ride. And apparently, as the ride is starting, the paper bag is still on the audio animatronic. So one of the Imagineers runs out there, pulls the paper bag off, gets off scene so that they can go through there. Eastwood sees it, says, you know, oh, that's awesome that I'm in here. And they get him to sign off on it. So like <laughs> 10 days before it's done. And the idea that there's an audio, anim- like, that just, it's awesome to me that these are the kind of stories that go on behind the scenes of getting, you know, and, and the thing is, again, to us, do, did you ever, did you ever even think about the fact that Ingrid Bergman doesn't talk in no. the Casablanca scene? I didn't. I didn't think about, you know... Uh, I, you know what, though? I've never seen that movie, so I wouldn't even know if she was supposed to talk. Okay, so when we're done recording, you're going to go watch <laughs> Casablanca because you need to watch it because it's a I've great... I've tried. I've tried to watch it. I don't like it. Oh, my gosh. I didn't make it. I know. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you need to... I, I'm sorry to everyone who's listening. You need to try again. You need to try more harder because that's a great <laughs> film, you know? And, and I don't... I don't like saying that about movies just because they're classics, but I, I think that's a really good film. So anyway, uh, but yeah, so you never, you never notice that. Um, Jim Hill had pointed out that, you know, that the Clint Eastwood audio animatronic doesn't really move around a lot. And that probably has a lot to do with the, the time crunch in which they had yeah. him built. He might as well uh, be a mannequin. <laughs> right, right. And <laughs> again, you, they, they got a believable looking Clint Eastwood out there. So props to them and whatever yeah, it looks you know, really good and whatever amount of time that they had but you know and and, and again the the fantasia scene like all of these things people were pulling their hair out over and freaking out because it was potentially going to ruin everything they did but at the end of the day we don't notice it we don't right. even, we have no clue how much blood sweat and tears went into something like this and we're just like oh that was fun okay now I got to go because it's about time for my fast passes over at, uh, you know, uh, toy uh, over at Midway Mania. Right. And I got to go hit that up. So peace out. Great movie ride. You were fun. Having no having no idea of what all was involved. Right. And yet it's still a great movie ride. (laughs) Oh, You really had to go there, didn't you? It's a real shame that Robert Osborne passed away. Um, he will be missed. I, I have a special place because my dad used to watch uh, Turner Classic movies all the time. Um, but I, one thing, and and I, I had this feeling uh, when Carrie Fisher passed away too. Um, I and I felt weird about about it for for a while, but you know I'm really glad that she was finished filming for uh, Star Wars because I I think that she would have wanted that to be you know something that was done and i'm really glad that robert osborne got to be involved in the refurbishment of the great movie ride because you know just from writing uh from writing great movie ride and and hearing his parts and stuff he actually sounds like he's having fun you know it it, it was his job for god knows how long to introduce all these movies and i i bet that there's not a person alive who knows more about old movies than he did because his job was to talk about them and so for him to get to be a part of an attraction that um is basically a love celebration letter to, of that yes. yeah and, and old, of older films i think is awesome and i'm so glad that he that he got to do that and that we have you know an attraction that could go on for 20 more years um that he is a big big part of he will be missed but man i'm, I'm glad that he will live on um, in the great movie ride. And I think that'll do it for this episode. You can follow us on Twitter at MTM Podcast. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash MTM Podcast. And you can visit us on the web at missingthemouse.co. Um, head over to YouTube and uh, subscribe to the show there. You can just search for Missing the Mouse and we'll be right there. Um, all of the episodes get released on YouTube at the exact same time as they do in the podcast feed. So if it is... If you would like to listen on YouTube, uh, we would encourage that. Um, Please head over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. It really helps us to share the show around and to uh, um, show up higher in search rankings and 
um, it, it really just helps us to know that you're listening and you're enjoying the show. Uh, so if you would do that, we would be very appreciative. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. And until then, have a magical day.